Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 299 of The Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Jeremy Green. Hey, everybody. And Jonathan Stark. Hello. And I'm Ruben Lerner. And this week, we have a very special guest. It is Sherry Walling. Hi, Sherry. Hey. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Um, Sherry, for the few people who do not know who you are, Would you give a a brief introduction? It has to be brief because you've done so many amazing things. Oh, well, so yeah, I am a clinical psychologist. I have a a PhD in psychology and I spend a lot of my time working with freelancers and founders, entrepreneurs, people who are trying to figure out how to run their own business and also have a good life. So I recently, well, I host a podcast called Zen Founder with my husband, Rob Walling, and then recently wrote a book called Keeping the Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your stuff together how to run your business without <laughs> letting it run you <laughs> it's and by the way sherry was uh, kind enough to send me a copy and it is absolutely fabulous it's really good so thanks Jonathan. i agree big plus I one I, I read it also and it was great i feel like the worst case scenario would be like you do all that work to write a book and like put it out there in the world and people are like eh, okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> so thank you i will take i will take all the love <laughs> <laughs> So, so I think a lot of us who start our businesses and are freelancers are like, well, I'm doing something I really love. I'll just put all of my time into it. And after N months, years, whatever, it'll just all be super successful and I can rest and relax and so forth. And I think I, I'm not alone <laughs> then in discovering N years down the road, wait, <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't happened. Maybe I need to reevaluate how I'm actually prioritizing in life. So um, my impression, given the fact that you do this for a living, is that there are other people like me who took a while to sort of or don't ever realize this. Um, what is it about us? Like, what, what, are, what, what are we doing wrong that we prioritize work so, so much? You have found something that you love and you want to double down on that and spend as much time as possible doing that. And that's not a that's not a bad thing. Like, Like, first of all, let's just acknowledge how awesome it is to be able to make a living doing something that you enjoy. So that's like a great starting point. I think the the problems arise when one, things happen that are outside of our control. So you can be really awesome at what you do and be really smart and work really hard. And, you know, your business might not thrive or things don't always work out. And that can have to do with Google settings or some like weird other thing happening that influences how your business goes that doesn't have anything to do with you. Um, I think the other thing that most of us experience is that, um, when we go all in on work, we are not like by definition, then choosing not to invest in other parts of our lives. And I think it's probably kind of a, a good recipe for psychological health to diversify your holdings, so to speak, like have a variety of things that are important to you and that you care about and have invested in, in your life. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, but it's just maybe not the best um, long-term plan to to spend your whole life focused on one part of your life. I, I like framing that with investment terms. Um, I had some, you know, like Reuven mentioned that, you know, I had a time in my life where I was just super committed, always working all the time thinking, you know, all right, I'm going to hit it big and then I can take a break. And Along, you know, at the same time, I was also thinking, okay, I'm gonna hit it big. I don't need to save money now. Uh, and 
kind of at the same time, I happened to kind of realize that, okay, looking for the the big win is really kind of like playing the lottery and it's not a, a great long-term strategy. And so I need to have backup strategies in play that, and at the same time kind of started, okay, I need to really start saving money and investing money to make sure that I'm in a good financial place in the future. And then at the same time kind of realized, oh, and I really also need to not work all the time and invest in myself and my life and my family and make sure that that's going to be in a good place in the future. Uh, I like the kind of the parallels there. Yeah, I think I think the make it big plan is is amazing when it happens. But of course, it's kind of a low frequency event. Mm -hmm. So and I, I love I mean, I get to work with really smart, motivated people and have these kinds of conversations. And and many of them and many of you are, are certainly very capable of making it big. But again, you come back to like the limits of what's controllable to you. And then the fact that you're putting a lot of investment on a low probability event. Mm -hmm. So I talk a lot, oh, I talk a lot about feelings and emotions and life stuff, but I'm, you know, I'm a statistician by training. So <laughs> I like, the, I like the numbers too. <laughs> Let's play the numbers. <laughs> well, are there, are there particular areas that of life that freelancers chronically underinvest in? Like, are there the top three that, that, you know, sort of freelance folks just like always blow off until it's critical? I think, um, sleep is probably one. Mm -hmm. And then Amen the to that. accompanying yeah. like diet and exercise. Like, I think it's really, really easy to neglect your body, especially when you're in the middle of a big push, whether you're launching something or you're in the middle of a big project, it's really easy to sort of justify, like, I'll do that later. And most mm -hmm. of the time later doesn't come or later comes too late. Um, I, I think that's probably the like hands down the fastest thing I see people give up on. I also think time with friends. I mean, I think most of us have it sort of hardwired. Like I need to talk to my kids and see them regularly. So that tends to stay intact, but it's like friendships, like the time where you're, you know, watching football or drinking beer with a buddy events that aren't generating income or pushing your business forward, but they're still important in terms of connecting you with other human beings. Human beings. What are those? <laughs> They're the yeah. people who pay you money when no 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 oh. <laughs> no not those people the other people <laughs> yeah I mean I I don't even feel like we need to pile on like it's so obvious that what you just said is true like yeah. me everybody I know you know it's like the my uh, my well so here's here's an interesting and related question so my friend network is largely online I have way more friends online than I do that are physically proximate to me. Does that, is that, it can't be as good. I mean, it's certainly nice because I remember when I didn't even have that and it's much better now that I'm in slack rooms with, you know, other, you know, masterminds with other entrepreneurs and other freelancers and consultants and that sort of thing. And it's super, super helpful. That, that level of connection is great. And, uh, you know, occasionally we meet in person, but we're not near each other at all. So does that, like, how does that, how, how do you think that might play out? Or like, is that a, is that some kind of a substitute? Does that help at all? Is that better than nothing? You know, the slap slackification of friendships. Yeah. I, I, it's such a great question. And I think obviously the nature of friendship and relationship is, is changing, especially for those of us who spend so much of our lives online. And I, I mean, I, I think that those are real friendships, <laughs> like, especially, you know, the way you describe it, it sounds like we're going beyond like social media people. This, this isn't just like you post, they post. These are like real interactive friendships where you're having uh, deeper conversations or just more in-depth conversations. Yeah. Sharing, um, sharing private information. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's thank goodness that we have access to people all over the world that we can share life with. I, I, that the way that our, our brains are sort of built around 3d people. So there is something added by being in a room with someone and reading their nonverbals and having kind of shared three-dimensional experience. That's a more immersive friendship. Um, uh, like an update. So you and I were both in Stockholm almost exactly a year ago uh, at the W Freelancing Conference, and you gave a talk there um, about this sort of thing. 
And um, at some point you said, you said something which I don't know how often you say this, but it's super, super resonated with me, which is I kept saying, oh, I'm just working on my business, I'm working on my business. And you said, well, think about it from your spouse's perspective. Well, fast forward nearly a year and partly based on what you said and partly based on realizing, wow, this is nuts. For 20 some odd years, I've been going on crazy small amounts of sleep every night. Like I was sleeping maybe four to six hours a night um, because I had to get lots of work done. And I started sleeping more. And what do you know? My business has survived. And what do you know? I can spend more time with family and my business has survived. And what do you know? I can exercise and eat better and feel better about myself and even losing weight. The, the fear that I had for such a long time that if I don't spend every possible moment of my business, my business will collapse, turned out to be more fear than reality. And I've been stunned to discover that, what do you know? Things are not only okay, but they're even better. So I, yeah. I credit you with not a small amount of that. Hey, I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I think you just like perfectly articulated a lot of, a lot of what like I want to put out there in the world in the sense that um, working a lot is not the same as working well. And when you make that investment in taking care of your mind via sleep and some exercise and just making sure that like your neurons are functioning reasonably. And then when you make that investment in your, in your family life, usually it does yield major benefit for your business because you are, you are well, like you are a better functioning human being. It makes sense when you say it, but in the moment, it's like, oh, this client really is freaking out. And, uh, mm -hmm. or I bill by the hour and I need more money. So I'm just going to work a little bit more. Yeah, Look, it seems I, like I there's do. a never ending string of justifications that you can use to kind of keep doing that uh, with that if you don't make real, a, a real concerted effort to change it. Well, look, I mean, I have the advantage of doing all the like the training, like training is day to day. And so I sort of can predict with a large degree of confidence what my income is going to be for the month. And so the other stuff I was doing was sometimes nonsense and sometimes side things that just didn't work out. Like, I mean, this was part of what led me to kill off the, the Chinese newsletter because it wasn't really helping my business. And it was just taking time, time I could spend either sleeping or with family or taking care of real business stuff. And what do you know when you get rid of things that aren't core to your business? Um, you have that time and you're able to, yeah, concentrate more and think better and the relationships are better, like really net net plus on all fronts. I think when we operate out of a scarcity mentality, it becomes really hard for us to separate anxiety from like factors that are sh actually shaping whether we should or shouldn't do something. So when we constantly feel like there's not enough time, I need more money, I need more time, I need more money, like, and we're we're operating under the assumption that we just won't ever have enough, then we sort of frantically try to shuffle rather than really look at sort of like, like you were able to do Ruben, like, what do, what do I actually need to be doing? What is not important to me? How much money do I have to make? How do I make that happen instead of this assumption that I won't make it happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul Jarvis, who's a friend of the show sends out a weekly newsletter and the, the one that, came out this past Sunday was about defining what enough is for you and, and just making it conscious. I don't know if it's an American thing or not, or it's just a human thing, but it seems like there's this like always more, you know, and if you're measuring your success in a financial way, then, you know, where does that end? It doesn't, it, it doesn't end well. <laughs> so, right. so we, yeah, we, we just over the last, I'm oh, sorry. I mean, we just over the last like six months or so, eight months or so, maybe even a year, I just started to get serious about budgeting as a family. And that, I mean, this is all part of like, they're different processes, but they're all interconnected. And the moment that we started being serious about keeping track of our budget, that lifted a huge amount of stress off of me as the main breadwinner for how much we had to bring in. And suddenly it was no longer the more money, the better. And then suddenly it was, oh, we just have to make this amount. And if we get there, we're okay. Huh, what do you know? That's something that we did in our family pretty early on. Uh, so my my husband, Rob, made the transition from consulting to having a, a couple of, you know, his own products. And it was this weird transition because we went from like, he went from making, you know, a lot of money consulting to like really building up from the bottom. And we sort of said, okay, like you need to make, I think at the time it was like $5,000 a month. Like you need to make that amount. And that comes back to our family and everything else that you make, like you can reinvest in your business, 
whatever, you know, use it for AdWords or something. And, and that, and then I, of course, you know, had my own contribution to the family, but like that simple number made, it just took the stress off of us as a family and it took the stress off of our dynamic. And then I wasn't like, did you make your number? Did you make your number? It was like, you, you just, he made his number every time. And it, we had this really clear sense of what enough was. Yeah. I think a lot of people sometimes get in the, or I, I know I've been there before anyway, of kind of feeling like my goal is I don't want to have to budget. I want to make enough money that I don't have to budget. But then the lack of having the budget makes the enough money part of it just unbounded and you, you can never get there. Um, and it, it feels counterintuitive to me anyway, but yeah, I agree with what you guys have been saying that, you know, kind of doing that budgeting and going through that process really does help a lot. Yeah. The fish grows to the size of the bowl. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's good. And there's lots of really expensive shoes in the world. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think about this all the time because I'm always talking about pricing and, and I mean, I, it's not uncommon for somebody to spend seven figures on a watch. So like you'll never have enough money if you've got if, if you let your your taste get out of control. Uh, it, it's you can spend any amount of money. I mean, it, it's uh, it's there's so many examples. So speaking of examples, there's I feel like there's this kind of um, I feel like it's worth calling out somebody like Elon Musk who who famously works like twenty four seven. Like it, it manages like. How many, how many companies is the CEO of? It's ridiculous. And he seems, you know, he's admired by many, I think by lots of people, he seems to be doing things that are really moving the needle for the species, <laughs> you know, who knows, but his work ethic just strikes me as uh, toxic, you know, and it sounds in, in from reports, it's like a toxic place to work because it's just like, you know, way, way overcommitted, you know, it's just like, if you, if this isn't going to be your whole life, go work somewhere else. And it feels like it's almost like, um, certainly for the entrepreneur group that you, uh, in your audience, I would think that, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you address that? You know, it's like, do you have to decide that you're going to do something small to have a life? You know what I mean? It's like, you see the, the kind of magazine cover thing, and it, you see this role model and it's like, oh, I need, I need to do what Elon does. Right. I don't know. It seems, it seems, um, seems bad. I don't know how to deal with it though. I don't know if you want his personal life. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I suppose that's the thing, right? I, I think it's, I don't know that it's really a life that's available to all of us. I mean, I think he's exceptionally brilliant and exceptionally able to, function on, you know, little sleep or with significant amount of pressure. Um, I, I guess if you feel like that level of contribution to the world is within your scope of ability and that's what you want to do, like blessings to you. I don't think I could like, so I, I guess I, on one hand, maybe I, this is a really roundabout way of saying like, I think part of wisdom is also knowing your limits and deciding how far you want to push toward the limit of your own ability and your own capacity to be productive and, and sort of move the world forward. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm putting you on the spot with an edge case. It does seem like, it does seem like though it, that there's a sort of ethic in Silicon Valley at large that, you know, Hey, you know, I worked my buns off for my entire twenties or something and exit for, billion dollars. And it, I don't know, it, it seems, uh, it's, it seems unhealthy to me, but I'm old. So <laughs> where, <laughs> where does that, where does that sort of, I mean, is, is that just the kind of thing you need to learn or, or what I would love to hear you say is like, well, you know, when I talk to people now, they're a lot more conscious of this, like younger people are more, uh, aware, you know, maybe they're, I don't know, maybe things aren't as hard as they were. And now they can focus on things that are a little bit, you know, it seems like meditation is making a big comeback, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's, there's an increased ability to choose 
I mean, Silicon Valley is not the center of the tech world anymore. And, you know, you have folks like those of us in this conversation who have chosen different levels of how we want our lives to be and, you know, chosen not to live in San Francisco in our case. Um, yeah. and I had, um, this is going to sound super name droppy, but I, I had the good fortune of, of sitting next to Patrick Collison, one of the co-founders of Stripe at, um, a luncheon and he, you know, he's worth like pseudo billion, like many billions of dollars, like, and he's maybe 27, 28. Mm -hmm. And I think I was struck by just how very aware he was in that moment that like they, they rode a rocket ship. Like he was really lovely and humble in the sense that like, look how cool this is that this happened. Not the like, look what my brother and I did. And he's like, I'm along for the ride. I'm going to steward this. I'm going to do the best possible job I can do with this opportunity that I've been given. But it, it didn't have this sense of like, I worked really hard and now I'm a billionaire. Like he wasn't taking this deep credit for it, which I guess is, it's, it's important to point out because I think we feel like a lot of this is in our control and not all of it is. Right. So when it gets out of control, it can be like a, a bash to the ego. I love that. Yeah. I love that you're surfacing a posture of service, surfacing a posture of service. So it's like to, to, there's the, the one thing, the sort of explicit point that you're making is that he recognizes that it was partially, let's just summarize it as luck, you know, good timing, right team, smarts, all the market opportunity was there and all those things. He doesn't feel like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a genius. I figured this out and made it happen. So I, I think that's huge, but I, I also want to call out that sort of underlying kind of, you know, I want to steward this thing that happened, you know, and I feel like a responsibility to maybe our, our users or, uh, to the people that this is enabling to create businesses that otherwise wouldn't be able to. And I guarantee you that drives a lot of the, the product decisions they've been making, especially recently where they're just trying to make it really easy for people to deal with something that's difficult about putting a business together. Yeah. Yeah. So Sherry, could you maybe talk for a few minutes about kind of burnout and the different stages of that and then kind of, you know, the difference between, oh, I need, I clearly need to get away for the weekend all the way up to, you know, there've been famous cases of people just burning down their careers and walking away because they just decided they had enough um, and kind of how those stages progress and what people can do to address some of those. Yeah. So burnout is, um, kind of a, a psychological syndrome, I guess is the best way to say it, where people, um, experience feelings of being very cynical and detached from their work. They feel like no matter how hard they're working, they're not pushing the ball forward. Like their effort doesn't equal output. And then they also feel sort of deep physical and emotional exhaustion. So those are kind of the three clusters of burnout. And again, it's subjective. Like you can feel like nothing's getting accomplished and that can be completely detached from objective reality of what you're <laughs> accomplishing in your business. It, is, it lives mm -hmm. in your head in a way that's not necessarily rational. And, um, you know, it's caused by too much work. It's caused by feeling out of control of your work and out of control of like major decisions that guide your work, a mismatch between the things that you think are important and what your daily tasks involve. Um, it's caused by not enough support, you know, working alone or not, you know, working with clients that are extremely like emotionally draining. And I think the, what we have seen, the more research that's been done on this topic is we see like pretty significant changes in the brain of people who are experiencing burnout. So, um, a really active amygdala, which is the part of the brain that processes negative emotion or anxiety so that the amygdala is like firing. So you're just sort of swimming in all of this negative emotion. And then the connections between the prefrontal cortex, which is like the part of us that helps us calm down and helps us talk ourselves through stress, the connections between that part of our brain and the amygdala begin to fray. And so the, you're in this really nasty cycle where you have all this negative emotion and kind of an impaired ability to talk yourself through it or calm down. So it, it's a pretty serious thing, actually. I mean, it, 
it changes the chemistry and structure of our brain. It's also related to heart disease and other kind of stress related health problems. But it, it's certainly not something that has to happen. I, I think so. Some larger population studies in both the UK and the US suggest that it's about 30% of adult workers experience burnout at some point in their lives. So it's a pretty big deal. And because there is this great body of research, we do know a little bit about how to prevent it. Um, and we also know a little bit about how people can recover. And it usually takes a couple of weeks being completely off for some of those neurological changes to begin to reverse themselves. But more importantly than just taking a break, people need to get reconnected to what they find to be most important in their work. Um, I think like really simply burnout is caused by like too much work that's not important to you that you feel stuck in, in having to do. And so it's this return to, okay, this is meaningful. This is important to me. I value this use of my time. That's kind of mm. a, the road to recovery from burnout. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's I, I, I guess I, I always thought of burnout as something that only like business owners or self-employed people do, or maybe someone like volunteering a nonprofit. But the way you're describing it, it can happen to someone in any sort of job. I mean, what do you say? 30% of adults experience at some point. Yeah. Um, clearly 30% are not um, self-employed. So, yeah. so it can just happen in, in your job. And like, I guess all, I guess these people I know who say, yeah, you know, I have a job and it pays the rent, but that's about it. And they don't get excited about it. I guess those would be prime candidates as well, because it doesn't seem like they're doing something interesting, exciting or meaningful. Right. Not something that they care about. Mm -hmm. When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that, encrypted disks, and VPNs. Plus, they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files, and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code FREELANCERSHOW2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is FREELANCERSHOW2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available positions. Yeah, that's wild. That's it's so I, I think the just to call out the most helpful thing there is that uh, I've sort of understood for me is that I've, I've understood the concept of burnout, but you just <laughs> listed like three very specific symptoms that would help someone identify if that's what they're going through, which I've never heard articulated. That's super helpful. Yeah, there's so Christina Maslach is a psychologist at UC Berkeley who is this is her body of research and she and her team and now many other psychologists and sociologists and professionals like that have been looking at burnout for the last 30 years. So there's it, it's kind of like a popular buzzword in tech a little bit, which makes me like laugh and roll my eyes a little bit because it's like we've been thinking about this for a long time. We thought about it in <laughs> physicians. We thought about it in <laughs> teachers. And now we're now we're, now tech has discovered it, which is great. I'm glad. Like, welcome to the party. But there is <laughs> there is like existing research that can help that can help. Oh, so. but we love to reinvent things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, how we love that. <laughs> <laughs> Not invented here. But we invented exactly. burnout. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, from what you said, it kind of sounds like um, overcommitment can be a factor of burnout, but is not exactly the same thing. Right. It, it's one of, I'd say, like six or seven predictors of burnout. Um, and it definitely overcommitment contributes to the exhaustion. So if you're not, you know, coming back to sleep, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not giving your brain a break, then the overcommitment really drives exhaustion. Yeah. And kind of related, I, I suspect that when people get overcommitted, they end up with things that they don't really care about or that isn't all that meaningful to them. Uh, things that they wanted to say yes to more than they want to do. If that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, we have to be wise about this in our careers. I know like for me, in my 20s, I was, a, I was a graduate student. 
I said yes to everything. And I did a lot of different things. And I wrote papers and did research projects and traveled and, and I, but I didn't have kids yet. And I had a lot of energy. And then in my thirties, I had two kids and I was much more selective about what I committed to. And I'm, I'm turning 40 this year and I'm not doing anything I don't want to do <laughs> anymore. <laughs> So there are phases to this, of course, but they are based on your energy level and what your motivation is, not just taking more things onto the plate that, um, you know, you feel like you should or someone asked you to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's big. And I mean, not to make everything about hourly billing, but let's make everything about <laughs> hourly billing. Uh, <laughs> I, I guarantee you, I have no proof of this, but I have lots of anecdotal evidence that billing for your time is encourages you to work more like specifically work, you know, and it uh-huh. makes it difficult to do things like, like with me, I, I could always recognize when I was flirting with disaster, when I would stop exercising it, for a long time, I was a runner. I don't run anymore, but I still exercise. But I, for a long time, I was a, a avid runner and I could always tell like, Oh, I've been missing my run been missing my run. Oh, it's been two weeks. Something's wrong, you know? And I, okay. Thank goodness I had the, that it was like a, it was like a canary in the coal mine for me. Like if I've been blowing off, cause it's, it's something that I can still, I can still do my family stuff. I can still do my work stuff. But the thing that gets cut out is this personal thing that, that, uh, affected no one but me in the near term. And so I would, I would know, like, oh, I can tell I'm in trouble. I'm doing something wrong. And switching off of, if you stop trading time for money, it gives you a lot more flexibility in your, uh, you know, in your revenue generating possibilities. So you can do all sorts of different things. If your only option is to, you know, when you need more money, if your only option is to work more hours, look, time's unforgiving. You got to cut something out. It's going to be sleep. It's going to be exercise. It's going to be family. It's going to be friends. It's going to be something. And, you know, unless you're just watching a ton of TV, then it's probably going to be something important. And you just got, you just have nowhere, no other lever to pull. So, all right. So box over. I just wanted to <laughs> so it's trading time for money is renting your life away. It's really, it gives you no control uh, over situations like this. So I, I, I feel like it's, um, I feel like it's bad. <laughs> Something to I feel get like maybe from. you should like write a book about that or <laughs> <There's> a, uh, <laughs> do you know, a podcast. I never, I never have written, I, I've never written about the psychological <laughs> aspects of it. Really? That is definitely not in my wheelhouse. It's much more like, like, Hey, if you want to build by the hour, you are never going to make more money than the number of hours there are. So if you're not happy with that amount of money, then you need to figure something else out. And all of the client relationship stuff, I talk about that, but I've never gotten into the, the, just the personal impact that sort of that hamster wheel feeling, that drowning feeling. Yeah. Well, I think part of getting older is also realizing what do you know? Time is finite. Life is finite. Mm. You need to make choices and, um, like it was very nice when I was in college and all of us were just running on crazy you know, little amounts of sleep. It was even a, like a, almost a macho thing of how often you pulled all nighters and how little sleep you got and so forth. Mm-hmm. But like at a certain point you realize, why am I doing that? I can be using my time to do other things that are not work, that are not being forced to. And then because you're putting that constraint on yourself. You're going to choose the things that count more and are more interesting, useful, satisfying, gratifying. I think in some ways, like we've made a mistake about how we understand hard work and what success means. And I think we've we sometimes forget like the the pleasure piece, the love piece where you say, like, I'm I'm choosing to do the activities that really bring me joy and that that filter as a decision maker you know, can be really important in sustaining the like longevity of your business over time. When you are really functioning in your sweet spots, when you're doing the things that you truly enjoy, not just things you feel like you should do, not things that people tell you to do, not things that, um, you know, perceive may make you more money, but when you're really listening to the emotional quality of how you feel about your work, that can be a, a powerful way to prevent burnout, but also a way to just like have a better time with that finite amount of time we get on the planet. I, I, I often tell my children that I feel extremely lucky that I get to do something that I really, really enjoy um, and that there's demand for um, and, and, like, and that I have to be good at, right? Like if, if you just have two of those, 
not so good. But I realized that many people, <laughs> you know, I I really love doing something that people will pay me for, but I'm terrible at it. That that's a bad bad way to go. Um, but it it like it, it really means that I enjoy going to work and I enjoy what I'm doing each day. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting a lot out of the time that I spend doing my work. And that's part of the sort of the attractiveness. That's part of the, the danger and the trap because I enjoy it so much that, well, I can just sort of end up doing it even more. I need to pull back and say, well, there are other things I, I enjoy doing too. And there are other things that are important too. Yeah. How do hobbies play into this? Do you, do you, do you find yourself recommending that people take up a hobby if they don't have one. I can remember reading an article where someone was like, uh, it was something like, it might've even been you giving advice to people who were kind of on the rocket ride and saying, Hey, I, I know you're super slammed and everything, but you're going to sell that business at some point And that's that your plan is to sell it. And then you're going to have nothing to do. And that's the wrong time to, to find something new. Uh, I, I don't know if that was you or not, but, but, it occurs to me that uh, that's a pretty important thing because it's not, I've seen people struggle to find hobbies, which sounds crazy to me, but it's, it's, uh, you know, as a musician, there's like no end to the stuff you can do, but it yeah. does, it, it seems like uh, a real problem for people. I, I mean, I, I talk about it a lot um, in terms of it, you know, in addition to the things that you outlined, like from a neurological perspective, the importance of, diversifying the processes in your brain and also practicing learning. So when we get to the point in our careers where we're good at something, we, we may not be practicing sort of, you know, learning new tasks. And that can be a really important part of a hobby, whether you're learning to paint or learning to play guitar, or I love to do aerial yoga, which is like, it totally involves your whole brain. And if I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, I fall on my head, which is not a good thing. <laughs> so it, it requires you to turn off like this other train that plays in your head, like this other pattern and re-engage the world in a different way. And those are the best hobbies. And again, that can be, that can be something physical. It can be surfing. It can be running. It can be playing tennis. It can be something artistic. Um, it can be lots of different things, but engaging that you're engaging the world in a different way. is super good for your brain. Yeah. I've commented many times. Like I, I took up, I retook up karate about three years ago. I used to do it as a kid and uh, I stopped running and started doing karate. And, and the, the yeah. thing I keep on saying to people is like, it is the only place in my entire life where I have to memorize stuff, yeah. which is so wild. It's like a skill that I used to have because everybody had to memorize stuff. Well, I'm probably the oldest person on the phone call, but we used to have to memorize things. <laughs> you, you, you're not. You're not. No. Or, or, or if not, you're pretty close. <laughs> okay. But I think I – anyway. Got me beat. All right. Anyway, Ruben and I remember having to memorize things. And, phone numbers. Right. I still, remember my home, I still remember my friend's phone number growing up. Yeah. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, but, you know, <laughs> if I remember 40 years ago what Mark Ruben's phone number was. Anyway, so that the – the, and I know I do actually notice, and I think I probably, maybe I'm a little bit fine to are, are uh, acutely aware of this, but switching from being a keyboard all day and having GitHub and Dropbox and Google photos and all of these things that I, I, I remember used to, used to have to save stuff. You used to, have to press like command S when you're working on things. You don't even have to do that anymore. Everything's just saved always. And you don't have to memorize anything. You can look anything up ever. And going back to this sort of practice of like, I have to memorize this student creed. I have to memorize these moves. I have to memorize the, these defenses. It's the weirdest feeling. And I, it, it, I cannot explain like how different I feel after a class. And it's not just like, oh yeah, I got a good workout. It's completely different than that. It's like, yes, there's that. But using your brain, like you said, in that completely different way, has some sort of rejuvenating quality to it, or at least it, that's how it feels to me. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Space. Yeah. If your hobby is working on open source software as a software developer, that's yeah. not what we're talking that's about. Exa that, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> that's a contribution to the community. That's not a hobby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Start knitting. It's. I think it also is. It can feel really good to have that pre-post sense of accomplishment. Like, and I think hobbies are great for that, especially for those of us who work on longer projects or, you know, for me, my work isn't super measurable in terms of like, 
a good outcome is that something bad didn't happen. Like someone didn't get divorced. Someone (laughs) didn't leave their company. Someone didn't like end their life in a terrible way. You know, like those are, those are long game metrics and I'm good with that, but there's something so satisfying about like, I'm starting this hour in this state of mind. And by the end of this hour, I'm going to have like a plate of muffins or a painting or something to show for the time that's like directly observable difference because I came and I put in the effort and now here's the outcome. So I think that can also feel really good again for those of us who sort of work in these in these long range or uh, are working on big projects that take a long time to unfold. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like, you know, when you're done, I'm done. It's like a, a short task that you completed with mastery. And it's done. And now it's like, and then it, it sort of feeds your soul. It sounds kind of corny, but it has this, um, yeah, there's no, like in, in, speaking for myself, in my day job, there's, it's rare to have a sense of completion. There, there'll be wins. Like you'll sense a win, mm-hmm. you know, where like you coach a student into a situation and then this clear, clearly this metric moved in a positive way. And that, and that's great. It's something that's worth celebrating, but you're never done. It's like, uh, that's a never ending sort of thing, you know, and being able to say, Hey, here's my, I knit this sweater and now it's done. Here it is. Put it on. It's completely done. <laughs> there's nothing else to do. on it. And there's like a measurable endorphin bump that we experience neurologically with that, the, the sense of being done. So it's, yeah, it's, it's good. It's good for us to find ways to get that in our lives. So, so if someone's starting off, starting off a of business, like they, they, they're, they're not like, bitter like we are after years and years of having done it the wrong way. Um, grizzled. <laughs> grizzled. Oh, that's good. That's good. So what sort of steps do they take from the get go to, um, to ensure that things are good personally relationships and so forth? I know you mentioned some, I just sort of, I know we have a lot of listeners who are newcomers to this field and it's, it's a lot sometimes to try to find clients and manage the business and improve your skills. And this is like, so, so let's give them some more things to do. <laughs> Well, let's give them things that will make the other things less painful, maybe. (laughs) So, yeah, in terms of, like, protecting personal relationships, did I hear that question correctly? Yeah, 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 personal relationships. And also, um, yeah, let's start with that. I think that's a good uh, good place to be. Yeah, so I, um, I really think that there is an important place for, like, rhythms and structures in our relationships. I know, I know that doesn't always sound very like, um, sexy and flexible, but to have, um, you know, a weekend away every three or four months with your significant other, or maybe that's six months, but to have a, a regular date night that can be once a week, it'd be once a month, but, you know, it's just the regularity of it. And you knowing like, I'm going to have this one-on-one time with this person who's important to me. And I'm going to turn my phone off and I'm going to give them my full attention And they also know that they can expect that from you in that moment. So getting some of those things in place really early on, I think are really important. That also goes for friendships. It goes for time with your family. Um, And that, that means planning and it means setting aside time and saying, I am going to make sure that I am all in for this conversation with my spouse or with my brother because they need me and I need them. And this is an investment in this relationship at this moment. So that kind of answer what you're asking, Ruben? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. And I think the other thing is that you, you know, you want to have in place from the beginning, um, if you if you can find one, a good mentor, uh, a good mastermind, like a community of people who are doing something somewhat parallel to what you're doing so that you can grow together, but also, you know, have some guidance from people who are a little bit further along than you. Um, I think that's an invaluable resource in terms of both ideas and information, but just psychological and emotional support. And then of course, the, the, having those basic building blocks in place, like deciding at the outset that you're going to take care of your body and even like maybe setting some fitness goals alongside your business goals. Um, you can't really shortcut that, especially at the beginning. Yeah. I take it from the old farts that if uh, you don't lose it, you do. Lo- uh, if you don't use it, you do lose it, it <laughs> in- including your brain and capability of speaking. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it gets more and more important, not less. So, you know, if you're, if you're not, you know, come on, I mean, probably most people listening to this show are have headphones on and are sitting at a computer and if you're just mortgaging your future, it just gets worse. It's not like, it's not like, Oh, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not negotiable. It's not fine. It's not fine. It's not fine. <laughs> 
Um, Sherry, I wonder if you could just maybe help me understand a phenomenon that I've experienced myself that sort of makes a little bit of intuitive sense, but I don't I don't think I completely grasp it. Um, I've found myself before in situations where, you know, over a period of time, I've said yes to a lot of things that I'm involved in and going to help out or volunteer for various things. And then over time, become less fired up and enthusiastic about those things and, and become less involved and even eventually get to a, a place where, yeah, I, I'm not really doing that anymore, but I'm, you know, technically I'm committed and it's a thing that I do, even though I don't ever actually go do it. Uh, and it's still even not doing it, just having that commitment is still some sort of mental load for me. And when I then say, you know what, I'm, I'm no longer officially committed to doing this thing, I'm out. That somehow relieves a huge pressure and space to take on other things. And even though it doesn't actually affect my work because I had already pretty much checked out and it stopped doing that thing, it feels like it opens up new space to do new things. I think you really nailed that with the term mental load. I mean, I, I think those of us that are enthusiastic, relatively responsible, we keep our commitments. Like even if something is a commitment, really a name only, you still carry the weight of that. And I think there's always probably this part that's playing in the back of your head, either thinking I should be more committed to that thing I said I would do, or I wonder if I you know, you're having a conversation in your head about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the mental load, right? It, it, it sits in a little corner of your brain and takes up some space, even if it's a small amount of space. <laughs> so the freedom of saying like, nope, I am, I am not affiliated with that activity anymore. It kind of, it buys back some of that real estate in your brain. Big time. I, if I, if, when I put stuff on my to-do list, if it's there for more than a week, I just delete it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm obviously not going to do this and it's bothering me. <laughs> So I guess I was overly optimistic about my either ability <laughs> to get to it or whatever, but it's clearly not important. So goodbye. Yeah. Yep. To-do list bankruptcy. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm just contemplating doing that and how many people would get upset. <laughs> well, but, so but, those those but, ones but automatically come back. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Like if they were actually important, they'll just reappear. Like hmm. someone will nag you into remembering it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because the problem is, the problem is getting overly optimistic with things that you should do and put on your list that actually, you, that you sort of like, you have this overblown sense of, you know, just speaking for myself, it's like, oh, you know, I should do this. I should update this page. I should go check my bio over here. I should go do a uh, marketing thing, you know, and there's, it ends up being like, you know, is this a to-do list or is this like my garage full of a bunch of junk, <laughs> you know, and it, it weighs me down. Like I go to the list, there's some important things, there's some not important or less important things. And I just end up reorganizing the list and staring at it and just like, Oh, which one should I do first? I'll do the easy one. Cause I've got five minutes right now. And it turns into this, like, it feels like bees buzzing around me and it's very distracting. I'm just swatting at them uselessly. So I'll just be like, Hey, you know, it's like it, I wish actually, I wish the software I had had like an expiration date on to do is like, if you don't do it in seven days, it just disappears. And if it was actually important, it'll pop back up. Like who, who's the guy that started less accounting? Uh, Alan Branch. Yeah. Oh yeah. He, he when somebody sends me an email, he just deletes it. And if, <laughs> if the yeah. person doesn't send it again, it wasn't that important. <laughs> I could not stop laughing when I heard that. And I believe that he does it because he's that, he's got that kind of a big personality, but there's a certain truth in it, you know, cause people, people can, you know, people can treat your inbox like a to-do list for you. It's like the whole world can send you to do's basically. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, we could probably do, probably do another hour just on email alone, but <laughs> you know, it's like at some point it boils down to it's well, correct me if I'm wrong, please. But it, at some point it, it boils down to a certain level of discipline and enforcing boundaries around what you think is enough, what you think is important, how you think you should spend, be spending your limited time and resources. And it, it only, you know, only you are in charge of it. Like I, I remember thinking like, um, growing up, like, wow, I'm in charge of myself now. Like <laughs> it was the weirdest, it sounds so weird to say out loud, but you know, you move out, of, I moved out of my parents' house. I went to college. I was like, I can do whatever I want now, you know, and I mean, to more or less. And then after a while it was like, maybe I don't want to get totally smashed every weekend, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, Oh wait, 
I am the only one in charge of me now, barring, you know, laws, et cetera. But I'm, I'm the only one in charge of me. I'm an adult. I need to give myself some rules. Otherwise I won't, you know, it's just like you just squander all of your, your resources in ways that have no impact on yourself or the, your life or your family or your, the people you're trying to help and the, the world at large. So, you know, at some point there needs to be some level of discipline. I to talk about not sexy. That's not fun at all, but you know, it's like yeah. you're in charge of yourself. And if you don't take charge of yourself, then your inbox probably, or your clients are going to take charge of you. And you just it, mm-hmm. end up this reactive mode where you're burned out. It, it's so amplified too, being a freelancer. I mean, it's like adulting to the nth degree because you're assuming responsibility for the entirety of your of your living, mm-hmm. the entirety of your life. So you have to choose what is important. You have to choose how you spend your time. And, and like you're saying, not let other people dictate it for you because other people will <laughs> they have lots of opinions. <laughs> oh, yeah. huh. Wow. Uh, yeah. Should we, should we, I don't have a, we should, we should probably sum up and go to, go to picks. Yeah. yeah. Even though we, we could do this for a long time. Yeah. Easily. Um, I mean, Sh- Sherry, do you have any like last uh, insights or suggestions to share with people? I mean, then we'll, then we'll do picks so you can then like add some things if you want. I don't know. Well, I guess, I don't know if this is an insight or anything for people, but I'm, I'm taking this call from Leon Nicaragua <laughs> and I'm here to, um, do a training for a community about responding to trauma. So like a very like psychological thing, but I'm, I'm just like loving that I get to be here and be on the phone with you guys <laughs> and like, just be, I'm like, I'm super grateful for the amount of cool opportunities and cool stuff there is to do in the world when we're awake to that and looking for the things that are important to us and like listening for the opportunities that make most sense. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of like goodness to be involved in, in the world. And I think it's, it comes down to that burden and responsibility of choosing well, and then, and then going for it. That's great. That, that's, that's a great note to, to sum up on. So let's go around and do picks. And uh, let's see, Sherry, since you're our guest, we'll, we'll let you go first. Did, did, did you bring any picks? Did we warn you about this? I don't know. <laughs> if, the answer could be no. All right. uh, I'm going to pick your book if you don't pick it, so you might as well tell yeah. people a little bit What's about your book. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> pick something that yeah. you want to talk about? Tell people a little bit about your book, maybe, because I think that's I think anybody who finds this conversation remotely interesting should absolutely read it. Yeah. yeah. So, um... So I guess, yes, I will, I will pick my own book, which seems a little bit uncouth, but whatever you told me to, <laughs> we do it all the time. <laughs> <Arm twisting>. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is a book that I, it's one of your writing that, um, really outlines, I think the best insight that I can come up with about kind of the mental health game plan for founders, entrepreneurs, freelancers, and it's mental health in the like broadest sense of that, um, how to thrive and how to be happy and still work hard and take responsibility for the work that you're choosing. So very much along the lines of the conversation that we've had today. Fabulous. All right, Jonathan, what you got in terms of picks? Uh, I will point everybody to James Clear. He does a a very popular mailing list about building habits that I think is super relevant to the conversation. Uh, his, I mean, if I if I could summarize his core premise, it's that you know it's it's not about setting like huge goals for yourself. It's about identifying what the next action is that you can take to reach the goal and focus on accomplishing the action ideally in less than two minutes. So you've got some sort of two minute activity that you can do virtually anywhere, anytime that will get you one teeny bit step, one teeny step closer to the goal. And he he just has a fabulous way of describing it and giving people tips and tools. And he was the person who, who uh, recommended that I get that productive app installed on my phone, which I've talked about in the past. It's just, it's a total game changer. It's like this daily habits, two minutes a day, and it adds up so quickly, whether it's around a hobby or diet or exercise or uh, work or marketing or customer outreach, whatever it is, it's incredibly, it has been incredibly effective for me. So check out, I think it's jamesclear.com, but we'll put the, uh, a link in the show notes if that's not right. That's it for me. All right. Jeremy, you got anything this week? Uh, yeah, I would pick the positioning manual for technical firms by Philip Morgan, previous, uh, panelist on this show. Uh, I think it is a great 
book not only for technical firms, but for uh, solo developers uh, that are doing freelance stuff. I think finding good positioning helps solve a lot of other problems in your business and can help free up kind of brain space and time to do other things. And kind of as a follow-up pick on that, uh, I would just encourage people to have hobbies. Uh, for me, my picks for that are music and photography, but doing things that get you out of your normal day-to-day -day work are really great, and I highly recommend them. Excellent. All right, so I've got a fun pick this week. Um, so a few weeks ago, I saw the headline of a story in The New Yorker. I said, okay, this is going to be just weird and boring. It was one of the coolest, most fascinating stories I've read in a while, and the title is Japan's Rent-A-Family Industry. And here's the subtitle. <laughs> People who are short on relatives can hire a husband, a mother, a grandson. The resulting relationships can be more real than you'd expect. This was one of the – you know how sometimes you read something, you say to your family, oh, my God, I can't believe they just wrote – like I was spending probably two hours or an hour doing this to my family. And they were like, okay, now we, we don't need to read the article because you just read the whole thing to us. It was so wild and crazy and funny and interesting. I strongly recommend that people read it. Uh, you, will, you will laugh. You will cry. You will want to rent a family. Wow, Ruben's family now they're on they're on notice. They've got competition. <laughs> Anything can be had. Lease a family. Right. It's cheaper to lease, actually. I think <laughs> lower risk. All right, and with that, with on that positive note about our uh, work life balance, yes, forget uh, investing in relationships and whatever else we said. Literally investing. <laughs> Just for a family. <laughs> <laughs> family you really want. <laughs> um, Sherry, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it and, uh, and your insights. And, and um, Jonathan and Jeremy, thanks as always. And thanks to you for listening out there in podcast land. And we'll be back next week on The Freelancer Show. See you guys. So long. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.